second sentence. Two. At one time or another, many of us have seen the Consafo sign off on Chicano placas and graffiti in the Southwest or Midwest. It's a very common Chicano symbol, but its true origin and significance is nebulous. It is not a Mexican symbol, but a Chicano, a Mexican-American symbol. Its origin is unknown, but like the Pachuco, it's probably originated in South El Paso's Segundo Barrio. The C slash S sign off means consafos and translates literally as with safety. It was meant as a safety precaution, a barrio copyright patent pending. No one else could use or dishonor the graffiti. It was an honorable code of conduct, a literary imprimatur. Like saying amen, it ended discussion. Above all, it meant anything you say against me will bounce back to you. Most kids respected a placa if signed off with the consafo. Without that symbol, a placa would sooner or later get scribbled on or erased. Some kids would put a double C slash S sign or put XXX after it, or a skull and crossbones, which physically threatened anyone who did not honor and respect the code. A precise definition for consafos or safos is lacking because it comes from Caló, a Chicano dialect. Caló originally defined the Spanish gypsy dialect. But Chicano Caló is a combination of a few basic influences, Hispanicized English, Anglicized Spanish, and the use of archaic 15th century Spanish words such as truje for traer, to bring, or aiga for aya from haber, to have. These words were left in isolated pockets of Northern Mexico and the Southwest, especially New Mexico, by conquistadores españoles. In this country, Caló is not recognized as a dialect, but is derisively called Tex-Mex, or Spanglish, without taking into consideration its unique multicultural, political, societal, and linguistic function and formation. Returning to Consafos, the closest possible Spanish word from which Safos could have come would be safo, from safar or safado, which translates to slip or slipped. This is a plausible definition since the C slash S is meant to let insults slip off, to protect and shield from attacks. In a game of marbles, Chicano kids use the word safis if they let the marble slip before shooting it in the right direction. By saying safis, the marble shooter was allowed to try again. Some Chicanos will also end a placa, graffiti, with the message, sin zafos, which means that with or without safety, with or without this code, whether you like it or not, whether you insult me back or not, this placa, insult, or praise stands. Nowadays, there is also a Gonzafo's hand sign that is rarely, if ever, used. It entails a raised hand, palm open towards your opponent, but with the fingers bent down over the top of the palm to act as a shield and deflect any insults back to the perpetrator. This was primarily and most effectively used against finger throwing, and it had as much validity and effect as any spoken insult. Chicano artists and writers of the late 60s and early 70s often used the C slash S symbol in signing their works, especially when the works were political or cultural in nature. There was even a magazine entitled Consafos. In these short pieces, my ending logo is the C slash S sign, like an amen. Whether you agree with me or not, whether you like it or not, with all due respect, this is my reality. Consafos. Three, pendejismo. Most popular Mexican cuss words began with a P. 
why words such as pinchi, puto, politico, and pendejo carry such a harsh negative sound, I don't know. I'm not a linguist. Pinchi or pinche is used to describe someone who is mean-spirited. The degree of insult depends on the intensity, the context, and who is delivering it. I don't know why the word is considered vulgar. In Spain, a pinche is a kitchen helper, and a few restaurants are named El Pinche, which many Mexican and Chicano tourists find hilarious. Once when I was a kid, my big sister was angry and wanted to pinch me, so I said, no pinching. She ran to mom and said, mama, Antonio called me a pinchy. Well, mother, proper and educated woman that she was, gave me a tongue lashing that I never forgot. And I could never convince her or my sister that what I had said was no pinching. To this day, my sister will only laugh and say she doesn't remember anything, but my ears still sting. A puta is a whore in vulgar Spanish, as opposed to prostituta for prostitute. A puto is a homosexual. Pendejo is probably the least offensive of these P words. In Guadalajara and some other parts of Mexico, it is a common everyday word. For the non-Spanish speaking, the word is pronounced pendejo, not pendejo. Feminine, pendeja, plural pendejas or pendejos. The noun or committed act of a pendejo or pendeja is a pendejada. The verb is to pendejar. The term pendejo is commonly used outside of polite conversation and basically describes someone who is stupid or does something stupid. It's much stronger to call someone a pendejo than the standard Spanish estupido, but be careful when calling someone a pendejo. Among friends, it can be taken lightly, but for others, it is better to be angry enough to back it up. Ironically, the Yiddish word for pendejo is a putz, which means the same thing. In high school, I had a friend whose name I consistently forgot. I must have asked him for the umpteenth time when he finally yelled, Olivas pendejo. So I called him Olivas pendejo. At that same high school, we had a principal, Brother Alphonsus, whose favorite proverb was a reminder to students. Naces pendejo, mueres pendejo. You were born a pendejo, you will die a pendejo. Proverbs on pendejos abound in Mexican culture. Children say what they are doing. Old people recall what they did, and pendejos say what they're going to do. Dogs open their eyes in 15 days, pendejos never do. Of lovers that live far away from each other, it is said, amor de lejos, amor de pendejos. Love from afar, love for pendejos. The word can also be used to relieve pain. No hay pena que dure 20 años ni pendejo que lo aguante. There is no pain that lasts 20 years, nor a pendejo that will endure it. El Diccionario de la Real Academia de la Lengua Española, the Dictionary of the Royal Academy of the Spanish Language, defines pendejo as a pubic hair. The secondary definition of a pendejo is a coward. Then there are tertiary definitions according to country. In Argentina, a pendejo is a boy who tries to act like an adult. In Colombia, El Salvador, and Chile, a pendejo is a fool or a cocaine dealer. There are a lot of those in this country. Here and in Mexico, a pendejo is more likely to be a fool or an idiot. Señor Armando Jimenez, author of Picardia Mexicana, a collection of Mexican picaresque wit and wisdom, is also Mexico's foremost pendejologo, pendejologist. According to Don Armando, the number of pendejos, even as you read this, is innumerable. It has been estimated that if pendejos could fly, the skies would be darkened and we would enter a new ice age. 
the pendejos would get a severe sunburn. Some pendejos go so far as to believe that if all pendejos were to be corralled, there would be no one left to close the corral gates. That theory has been discounted by the fact that hurting pendejos would be like hurting cats. Pendejos have a mind of their own. The great majority of people, regardless of class, color, or creed, are pendejos, according to Senor Jimenez. His research study claimed that up to 90% of the world population are pendejos. Of the remaining 10%, 5% are mentally unstable. 0.5% are geniuses, and 4% are unemployed, the exact amount needed for a sound economy. The remaining 0.5% are lost. According to Jimenez, there are countless categories and types of pendejos. The following are but a few. The politicos who think they will change the world with money, charisma, or speeches. The hopeless pendejos, who blame all their problems on the bad luck instead of the fact that they are pendejos. The happy ones, who believe in their superiority over other pendejos who look up to them. The dramatic pendejos, who can be identified at a distance of one city block by their stance and by the way they walk, sometimes carrying a book or two. The pseudo-intellectuals, who act as if they are deep in thought on some theory when in reality, they are wondering where they parked their cars. The optimistic pendejos, who are naive, happy, and talkative. They look for hidden treasures, mines, underground water. They also buy lottery tickets, bet on everything, and believe in television wrestling. The pessimistic or doubting pendejos, who don't believe anything you tell them. If you don't believe this, you fall into this category. And if you do believe this, then you might fall into the category of those pendejos who believe everything. Entrepreneurial pendejos, who have grandiose projects, are eloquent, and make great salesmen. If this type convinces you, you are an even bigger pendejo. This list may be used for self-evaluation and to classify relatives, friends, and lovers. If you do not find yourself in any of these pendejo groups, congratulations. This means you're either a genius, unemployed, or mentally unstable. For those on the list, there is still no known cure, but you are not to blame. Nazis pendejo, mueres pendejo. Con sapos. Four, the joy of jalapenos. In Mesoamerican cuisine, Nothing compares with the gastronomic ecstasy that a hot jalapeno adds to the enjoyment of Mexican food. The piquant sensation on the tongue, the itch and tingling on the scalp, the beads of sweat on the forehead, the clearing of the sinus passages and the fogging of eyeglasses are all part of a cultural ritual in the ultimate Mexican eating experience. Even among Mexicanos, Many are invited, but few are chosen to enjoy the seemingly masochistic practice of setting your mouth afire while nourishing your body and enjoying the food. Like so many of my paisanos, I cannot for the life of me enjoy any type of food, whether it be gringo, Jewish, or Italian, without a good hot salsa, jalapeños en escabeche, pico de gallo, chile de árbol, hecho en mocajete, crushed red pepper, Tabasco sauce, Louisiana hot sauce, chile banero, or just a fresh dark green jalapeno. Chile might have formed me into the kind of person I am, sometimes hot-tempered and passionate. Back home at the family table, we could always count on having two types of tortillas, de maíz or harina, beans and three types of chiles, rojo, verde, and fresco, red, green, and the fresh, unadulterated jalapeno in all of its luscious, dark green subtlety. Sometimes we had hueros, blonde yellow peppers, very innocent looking, but just as deadly as the green ones. Other times we might have serranos, but while they were hot, they lacked the flavor of the jalapeno. Father always went for the hottest one. If it was a dud, 
he would ask for another. Sometimes one chile was so hot that it took two meals to finish. These gems were rare. There's a whole process to evaluating a salsa de chile, and it's not by looking at the label to see if it was made in New York City or Santone. First, you study it in the bowl. If it's too tomatoey, it was probably made for tender tongues. With the spoon, you sift it to check its consistency, the spices used and how it was made. By roasting, cooking the peppers in water first, topped in the blender, or cuisine art. But the best flavor comes from the mocajete. After the chiles have been roasted and peeled, they are ground on a stone mortar. The stone flavor and the ground seeds add a special earthy taste. A trained and experienced olfactory sense will tell you if it is hot or not. The fourth and final step is the examination and putting a small amount on the back of your hand and tasting it. Some like to use a corn tortilla chip, but that interferes and dilutes the flavor. You need to know exactly how hot it is so you can add the correct amount to your food. That ritual of tasting has all but disappeared with the sale of commercially made mild, medium, hot, and very hot sauces. But there is nothing like homemade salsa. Contrary to popular belief, Mexican food is not hot, which is why salsas were created. Tastes and preferences are personal, but I frown on restaurants that load the salsa with cominos, tomatoes, and onions. The taste of those ingredients remain with you more than the jalapeño taste. Chiles, whether they be jalapeños or serranos, have their own peculiar tastes that should be enhanced, not hidden. Nothing was more painful when I left home for the Air Force than to be served bland gringo military food. That's where I developed a taste for common, ordinary black pepper, Louisiana hot sauce, or Tabasco. The SOS eggs and sausage needed help. Since my departure from home, I have forever yearned for salsas and fresh jalapenos. From time to time, when I was in the military, mother would send me care packages of canned jalapenos and escabeche, or other forms of canned chile salsas. I was desperate and celebrated those few hot times, shedding tears of jalapeno joy with other Chicano buddies. In Spain, we introduced young Spanish women to what we told them were Mexican pickles. They had never heard of a jalapeno before. Their faces turned neon red. In Zaragoza, Spain, a woman friend invited me to her home for dinner. Without jalapenos, she made a sauce from crushed red pepper spices, and cognac. It was a fine moment in European gastronomic ingenuity. Exclusive restaurants and attended formal banquets with fresh jalapenos in my coat pocket. Banquet food can be boring and asking for the Tabasco sauce is a faux pas. If sitting with people who find such conduct reproachable, I simply cup my hands around the pepper and bite into it from time to time without their ever knowing. I have only been caught once, and another time a table companion confessed to me he wished he had brought jalapenos with him too. Once I gave a humorous presentation at the annual California Rural Legal Assistance Fundraising Banquet. Before the presentation, while people were eating, I went around fresh offering fresh jalapenos to go with their bland chicken. Some Hispanics were insulted and blushed while some Chicanos were delighted and blushed only after they bit into their dark green hot peppers. To get the most out of a fresh jalapeno, especially one that has been refrigerated, it is necessary to get its hot juices flowing. Cup the pepper with both hands and blow warm breath into it while rolling it on between your palms. This is called getting the jalapeño angry. It's supposed to get hotter if you curse it in Spanish. Of course, there are many kinds of chiles, but the jalapeño is king and named after the small town of Jalapa, Veracruz, where the character of the people is both piquant and picaresque. 
This is the same region that originated the dance and hot musical number La Bamba, perhaps inspired by the effects of a jalapeno. Much more can be said about this phallic plant food that can bring tears to the most macho of machos. With the Chicano movement, artists turned the jalapeño into an icon, a symbol, an image representing the culinary, piquant, and humorous aspect of Mexican culture. In a famous Mexican ballad, La Llorona, the male singer cries out, Yo soy como el chile verde, llorona, picoso pero sabroso. I am like the green chile, wailing woman, hot but delicious. The curative qualities and other little known facts of the jalapeño and its pepper cousins are many. Menudo, Mexican tripe soup, known as the National Mexican Breakfast of Champions, is known to cure hangovers. The truth? It is the chile 